My name is Matt Fiddler. Um, I'm here with Mark Weber Tobias. We're from security.org. Um, I'm a security researcher. Mark will give you his background. But the talk today is uh, things that go bump in the night, and it's really an analysis of bumping as a technique and as a new old threat. Um, <clears throat> as the introduction said, I'm a lawyer, but I'm a security specialist. Um, I wrote several law enforcement textbooks. Uh, probably the most well-known is Lock, Safes, and Security. Um, which is a treatise on the subject. In my former life, I was uh, chief of our organized crime unit in South Dakota with the Attorney General's office. Now I travel around the world uh, working with um, clients looking at uh, bypass, mainly of high security locks, but of locking systems and security systems, um, mainly in the physical world, not in the logical world. I leave that to you guys. And uh, we find uh, problems, bugs, glitches, that many of the manufacturers are not aware of, should be, but they're not, uh, because the design engineers in the world learn how to make things work, but they, they don't learn how to break them, and you can't design products if you don't know how to break them. So I spend most of my time now, I do practice law, but most of my time lecturing and uh, working for various clients, um, figuring out ways to get into things I'm not supposed to be able to. Um, and today, we're going to talk about bumping in the context of a real physical security threat. Um, you folks have IT responsibility, many of you, and are foisted with physical security responsibilities to protect your infrastructure. Um, a lot of you probably don't know or are not really familiar with what we're going to talk about today. Um, we've received some media coverage on it of late. Newsweek did a story this week and uh, posted on my uh, website is a very detailed analysis of bumping as a threat to security. I'd encourage all you to read it. There's also the legal issues involved in the United States. Um, you can download the PDFs. You should also look on Barry Wells' website, tool, T-O-O-O-L dot N-L, uh, for additional information. Uh, Barry's been really the leader in Europe on this issue, and I've been shuttling back and forth it really hasn't received any traction in America until now. I think that's going to change as of tomorrow. And so we'll go through our PowerPoint. And Matt? Yeah, so we'll, we'll hold questions to the end. Um, again, the PowerPoint is really going to go with a brief history of uh, picking locks. Then we're going to go into, or, or of locks in general. Um, and then we're going to uh, demonstrate uh, what, what bumping is, uh, the theoretical application of bumping. Um, we'll go into some case examples that I think you'll be pretty shocked at. We have some videos to show you. Um, and, and I guess, if, first of all, if we can just get a show of hands of how many people know how to pick locks. Oh, that's a pretty good turnout. That's a pretty good turnout. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And how many of you all have bumped open a lock? Wow. Uh, quite a few, but not really that many. Um, Yeah, exactly. So uh, it sh another right, show of hands. Right. Prior to, to the convention and the lockpick village and everything great that's been going on, how many people know how to bump or pick locks? Still pretty good. Yeah, okay, that's pretty good. And, uh, okay, so that works. And basically the premise today is that you all need to understand the physical security risks so you can make your own security assessment, not the architect, not the purchasing agent, not, not anybody that doesn't know anything about locks and security. Locks are the primary um, security level. There's a lot of layers, but locks are really probably the first one. And so you all need to understand so you can make your own risk assessments, not the locksmiths you're dealing with because they won't tell you most of them anyway. Um, so, Matt? So, so briefly, there, there's just want to review the types of locks that are available out there. There's warded locks. Um, typically, you see these locks on, on barns or outdoors. There's no springs, so warded locks tend to function well in, in outdoor environments. Hundred-year-old hotels use them also. Exactly. Uh, lever locks, uh, primarily used in, in Europe. Um, wafer and disc tumbler, you'll find these in your cubicles, your overhead compartments, um, storage bins. Uh, safes, very inexpensive safes. Um, pin tumbler locks, um, primarily in the U.S., um, it represents about 90, 95 percent of all the locks that you'll use on a daily basis. Um, there's the hybrid locks, combination locks that, that employ multiple um, facets of, of lock technologies. 
And again, lever locks, very common in Europe. We don't see them much well, in the U.S. Except for safety deposit boxes here. All safety deposit boxes are lever locks. And then again, pin tumblers uh, comprising yeah. 90 plus, 95 percent. And pin tumblers what we're really talking about today. So 4,000 years ago, the pin tumbler was developed in Egypt, and then it was forgotten about. And the original pin tumbler in Egypt is totally different than what it is today. In, the, in about 1860, Mr. Yale figured out that if you put two pins in a chamber rather than one like 4,000 years before, you had a very small, very secure lock. So that's where all this came from. Um, so the modern pin tumbler lock, there's always at least two pins in each chamber. Um, as Matt said, they comprise 95% of the locks in the United States today and a lot in Europe. Um, they you can be found in all security applications and again they're all based on the original Yale design there's billions of them um, and so to tell you how many just billions so in a perfect world um, locks can't cannot be opened without the correct key or code um, but the reality is there's just level of dif difficulties um, to, to opening these locks um, either through physical destructive forced entry or covert methods of entry, which, which we'll discuss. Right, and, and in my world, I don't deal with forced entry very often. I teach it, but I don't deal with it. Um, my thing is covert and surreptitious entry. Uh, so there's essentially no trace. You don't know if somebody was there, which is the big problem, especially in information security. If you don't know it's compromised, you can have a serious problem. Yes, yeah, so co covert methods of entry, we, we have picking, which obviously a lot of you know. If you don't know about it, go up to Skybox 206 um, in the Lockpick Village tomorrow. Um, impressioning is a technique um, using multiple mediums to take an existing key and um, manufacture a key from it, or by introducing something into a keyway to impression a lock and decode a key. Um, decoding, again, multiple methods uh, of bypass. Um, there's been a lot of talk uh, over the last couple of years about extrapolation of the top level master key. Mark, do you want to go into yeah. that briefly? Um, two and a half years ago, Matt Blaze uh, at AT&T, now with the University of Pennsylvania, um, really exposed this issue. He's really a cryptographer that's into locks. I'm sure many of you know who he is. Um, Matt talked to me and we ended up in the New York Times. Um, basically, uh, almost every master key system in this country can be compromised by a 15-year-old kid, um, there, and then they'll own your facility. I don't like picking locks anymore if I don't have to. I'd much rather compromise the master key system, have one key, and I get to go anywhere I want, and I know that I'm going to get there. Now, there's some, th there's some caveats with this, and if you use the right kind of locks, this is not true, um, but mo standard conventional pin tumbler locks, if you're using them on your facilities, you need to understand that they can be easily and covertly compromised so that you can derive the top level master key that'll open up every door in the facility. Now, this is based on the availability of blanks um, or keys that can be cut but I also should tell you, in my world, we have little machines that we can take a photograph of keyways and go back and generate a milled blank that will open your lock. And so you do need to pay attention to this vulnerability, um, as well as decoding, impressioning, and picking. So uh, we're going to talk about bumping today, but, but all the above methods, including bumping, require all pins um, to move together and, and create a shear line. Um, and, and separate so that a cylinder will turn and the lock will open. Um, and, and again, much like picking, it requires a tension wrench um, or turning uh, tension of the key to, uh, to allow that plug to turn. And as we'll discuss, the, the issue is, is the skill that's required in picking as opposed to other forms of bypass. So you need some prior intelligence. Um, as Mark talked about with master keys, you need to um, have access to the keys, one of the keys in the system. Uh, potentially there may be sidebars, and sidebars is an, a combination locking technique, an additional mechanism um, that uh, is employed to either provide for key control or additional security. And, and let me ask a question. How many of you, uh, if you know, use Medeco in your facilities? Do you know? 
Not that many. How about Schlage Primus? More. Um, these locks use sidebars. How many use ASA? Hmm, not many at all. Um, Medico probably has the largest market share in the country in the high security market. I would estimate 70%. They started it. Uh, Schlage Primus is right behind them. Um, these locks use sidebars, as we'll show you, and they're essentially secure with some caveats. Go. So as Mark mentioned, um, keyway information can yield a lot of, of details about a lock. Leveraging an easy entry machine with a picture of a key or the keyway, um, we can create a, a key. Um, so that's you know our pri prior intelligence. Um, an another method of uh, opening is, is identifying blanks. Um, or producing copies uh, your, own, your own self, um, simulating the key, clamshelling the key, impressioning, um, manipulating components. There's a whole host of techniques um, to cut or produce your own key. Yeah, you need to understand one of the techniques that we use is with silicone. Um, if I have your key for, for mm, two minutes, I can generate a copy of that key. I don't care whether it's restricted. Basically, I don't care what the key is you can make a copy of it. And so there's serious threats if you give other people your keys. And don't park your cars and leave your key ring in the car. So we're just going to um, talk about what a key is. In a couple slides, we have a, a pretty good graphic that depicts uh, what a key is. Um, the keyway is the opening, obviously, that the key is inserted. Um, the bidding is the actual cuts on the key, um, whether or not there's any secondary locking mechanism, like we talked about sidebars. Check pins typically used in Schlage, Everest, other types of locks. Um, not necessarily an additional security component, um, but an additional component for key control. Um, a lot of locks employ interactive components, um, sidebar sliders, um, and locks like the EVA MCS uh, introduce magnetics into their lock. Um, so this is really Mark and I's mantra for vulnerabilities and exposures associated with locks. And it's the 3T, 2R philosophy. Time, tools, and training, and then repeatability and reliability. And if all of these factors are low, i.e. I can uh, pick or bypass or bump a lock very shortly under a minute, I don't require any additional specialized tools, and I can teach an 11-year-old girl in five minutes how, how to bypass this um, repeatedly and reliably, then we have a significant exposure. Go ahead. Um, so we'll talk about bumping, um, the threat. We'll identify bump keys. We'll go through a graphic, talk about the term 999, where it came from, how to train someone, uh, the difficulties making keys. Uh, there are some considerations you need to know to produce bump keys. Um, can you leverage bumping uh, for covert entry? Um, again, is it something that's easy to learn and we have it? Uh, no, yeah. So why is bumping really relevant? It's a, it's a new old threat. It was actually developed in Denmark about 25 years ago. And it's, you know, as we said, recently come of age from 2004 in the Netherlands uh, with Barry Wells and his work. So. How do we focus, how do we crystallize why this is relevant? Um, this afternoon, uh, I was in the lock picking village. There was an 11 year old girl who's now figured out locks are an intellectual challenge. Um, Jenna Lynn, she's in the third row, stand up. She's the. This little girl is the star of the show today. Um, she opened a quick set and a couple other locks. She really doesn't understand the process yet. She will. But she opened the locks, and she opened them in a few seconds. From a legal standpoint, from a risk standpoint, that's a serious problem. That's why we're here today. And so, actually, I'm just kind of itching to ask the CEO of Quickset just exactly what does the term maximum security on your packaging mean? <laughs> now, does that mean that a 10-year-old can't open it, but an 11-year-old can? Because I'm sure all the consumers would like that question answered. 
So this is a, a picture of a bump key. Um, again, you need a key that fits the lock that you're going to be bumping. And all the cuts, as in this picture, indicate are cut to code um, for their deepest allowable depth. Uh, the 999 key terminology came out of Denmark 25 years ago. Um, there were some uh, locksmiths there that found that keys duplicated by code. Um, well, the, the, the deepest depth is in Denmark with their most popular lock, which is where I learned to bump, is a nine. So the numbers ran zero to nine. And you have to understand, all of the manufacturers code each depth increment for the pins with a number so that keys can be replicated by number, not by a physical key. So if I have your code number off your keys, I don't need your key. All I need to know what the blank is or the key way, I can go make a key. So some locksmiths figured out that if you took a key and cut all the, the cuts down to nines, stuck it in the lock and, and applied energy, you could open it. That's where it started. So and that's, that's why we call it a 999 key or a percussion key or a code 12 key, but it's all the same thing. Right, and, that, and at that time they weren't uh, employing hammers or any striking method. They were actually striking the key on a desk or, right. or a Right, this is when they surface. had a cylinder that, that was locked that they had to open quickly. They didn't want to pick it. They slammed it on the desk or their tabletop with a special blank or whatever they opened it. So here's our graphic that depicts um, basically the lock components. The key that's in here is not actually a 999 key. You see varying depths um, of cuts in, in the bidding, um, but it's descriptive of the type of cuts that you need to make. So here we have, I don't know if you can see my mouse moving here. Yeah, probably but, not. But um, this is the deepest cut allowable for this lock per code. Um, so there's really two uh, components of cutting this. Um, that is the depth. So in, in this case, it's zero through nine, and the spacing uh, between the cuts that need to be applied. There's two methods of bumping. The legacy or old method is one of just creating a 999 key with no other modifications to the lock. Um, the new method that's really be, been re reinvigorated by Barry Wells and Tool is the negative shoulder method. And in the negative shoulder method, um, a little bit of material is milled off or ground off the shoulder of the key right here, um, about a 0.2 mil, along with a little bit off the front of the key. And in this case, a negative shoulder method allows you to insert the key into the cylinder and just begin wrapping the key, applying tension, turning the lock, and opening it. This legacy method, by not trimming down the shoulder or the tip, requires you to pull out the key and there's certain locks that you'll identify through practice and trial and error that respond better or worse to either the negative shoulder or the legacy method. Um, so training, you know, what's really required? Um, you need to, again, understand how to position that key, where it needs to be placed. If you have a negative shoulder lock or it's the, the legacy method, how much force is needed? And the reality is it's, it's very little. Um, the common correlation I hear is the amount of, of tension that it takes to turn on a light switch. So you're applying very little tension to the key as you're turning um, and applying some kinetic energy or bump to, to the lock. And then ultimately how to reliably repeat this process. There are some difficulties making keys. Um, there's the availability of the keys, whether or not the keys are restricted. Um, any key, however, can be modified to, to fit your lock. So if you're in an apartment complex, um, your key to your apartment, assuming all the other, the other apartments in the complex have the same lock, when configured as a bump key will open every key in the complex. Yeah, it's not like a master key. If a master key system is designed properly, then there's one, at least one cut above all the change key cuts, so either you build up the key with solder or whatever, but it's not quite so simple. So otherwise, change keys are not supposed to be modified to master keys. In the bump key environment, this is totally different. Any key can be made into a bump key. Do you have a slide in there on where we get the keys? Oh, yeah, we do. Yeah. Coming up. 
Um, so covert entry via bumping, um, obviously there can be noise. There have been some techniques that have been published as of late of bumping, um, really wrapping with your fingers or the palm of your hand to reduce the noise. It's not very repeatable or reliable, but I have seen it accomplished. Um, so you are going to produce noise. Um, obviously, covert entry, depending on the condition of the lock, if you go up to the lock picking village, we have some demo locks that you can bump, but you'll realize quickly that some of them have been, been pretty much beat to shit and the pins are smashed. Um, the springs are gone and, and they're not opening. Um, but as our 11 year old proved, sometimes only one strike is required. And, and I should make a note that, and maybe we have a slide, but security pins, mushroom pins, um, the number of pins, it, it restricted keyways, it doesn't have anything to do with bump resistance. Sp spring bias, um, there's a whole host of things go into it. So again, it's trivial to learn, and, and we'll demonstrate this. We have some videos of a reporter opening a lock. Um, but there are variables that do affect bumping. You know, I talked about the condition of the, the lock, availability of the blanks. Um, there are restricted blanks that you just can't get anywhere. Do you want to talk about that, Mark? Um, there are restricted blanks, and for example, the Medico M3, that's got us, how many guys know what the M3 is? A uh, few, okay. The M3 is a standard biaxial medical that came out um, last year. It extended their patent another 17 years, 20 years, I guess. Um, it's got a side projection on the side that, that drives a little slider that provides a third layer of security. Um, this blank you're not going to get. Uh, obviously, if you really go to a lot of work, but that's not what we're talking about here. Uh, you can come up with it, but it, it is a seriously restricted and patented keyway. Um, the Everest blank with Schlage that's integrated into Primus, that's very difficult. Um, there are some keys that are very difficult, but um, the availability of most blanks for most locks is not a difficult problem. So we talked about uh, secondary locking mechanisms with, um, with Medico, with Primus. There are noise to tolerances, spring conditions or bi biases that definitely affect the locks. Um, lubrication, you know, if it's a really old lock, if the springs are all gummed up, if someone's attempted to use something like WD-40 or something else that should never be used in a lock, um, you're going to have trouble opening it. And one question I get asked, are new locks easier than older locks to bump open? There's, it's not much difference, although new locks I find are pretty easy, I mean, because they're, they're not there's no wear issues, or they open. Um, so, you know, one of the big variables is whether or not you have concerns over forensic indication. Um, a lock that's bumped singly in one hit um, pretty mm -hmm. much yields no forensic indication of opening. Um, I, again, our locks that we have up in the village um, have clear indication of opening yeah, via well, bumping. Yeah, okay. Uh, but it's a key that fits the lock and it will open the lock. So um, initially there's little or no damage. Over time there's excessive wear and tear and excessive damage. Um, whether or not you have depths and spacing info, info for the key blank that you're producing for bumping, the majority of this information for all the keys is available on the internet. Um, it's publicly available information on, for depth and spacing. But the reality is you can produce these keys yourself by eye. Um, so, you know, from a vulnerability perspective, it's, it's pretty yeah, severe. It's, that's the problem. It's not difficult, and that's the risk. Um, the shoulder and tip modifications, we spoke about certain locks that require a negative shoulder method. Um, you know, you're going to have better luck with the legacy method on some and negative shoulder on others, and through trial and error, you'll be able to figure that out. Um, whether or not the, the lock manufacturers introduce solid cams at the end to um, negatively affect bumping. Um, or if they've deployed anti-bump mechanisms, shallow pin cuts, there's a whole host of things popping up on the market in Europe, um, not yet in the U.S. Um, that we've seen. Yeah, this is going to be a huge retrofit problem. Uh, it's a little different between software and mechanical locks. And, you know, as I said, there's probably a billion locks in this country, and so this isn't going to be a quick fix. Um, misinformation. Um, not all locks can be bumped open. Uh, because of all the publicity in Europe, uh, everybody might think that every lock can be open, especially because of the stuff on German television. Not exactly. And if you all read the white paper that's on our site, 
Um, it'll really go into detail on, on myths and reality as far as bumping. Um, at the end of the day, 95% of the pin tumbler locks can be bumped open, but you still have to secure the key that'll go into the keyway. Um, and, and herein lies one of the issues we'll get into in a couple minutes, the legal issues here. If you're provided a pre-cut code cut bump key, so all the depth and spacing is correct exactly, then that lock's gonna probably be open unless there's some mechanical problem with it and this is the problem. So basically you need to understand pin tumbler locks, conventional locks that are not sidebar driven or, or otherwise, that is Primus, Medico, Asa, they're gonna be open. And so if, you're a facility, if you have facility security responsibility, you need to pay attention to the locks that you have in your facility. Yeah, so, so just another quick show of hands. Um, how many CISSPs are out here? Quite a few. One of the 10 domains, obviously, that, that you know is physical security. And you're responsible as an IT professional. Um, Sarbanes-Oxley, um, GLBA, HIPAA, all have um, components in them pointing to physical security. Um, and, and that security is just not in the virtual world. So uh, you're responsible and, and you need to take heed of this right. morning. So, you know, we talked about 90, 95%. What, what does that mean? That's your apartment, your office buildings, hotels, elevators, colleges, mailboxes, um, postal service. Uh, it, it really goes on and on. And I guess the question we want to pose to you, is it really a threat? We believe it is. Uh, so we're going to show you a case example. Um, we did some research, uh, both mailboxes, et cetera, and the UPS store, along with the United States Post Office, uh, Post Office rental boxes. Yeah, and let me just talk about this real quickly. Um, I looked at the Postal Service and, and actually uh, brought this issue to the attention of the Postal Inspector where I live, and, and it rapidly got escalated. There's about five million rental post office boxes in America and more on our military bases worldwide. These are all subject to bumping in seconds. So then the postal inspector said, well, what are you picking on us for? Why don't you go after UPS? So I said, well, why don't I do both of you? <laughs> and, and, and so I went and rented a, uh, a mailboxes, et cetera, box in Sioux Falls and then went and bumped that open, no problem, we'll, we'll go through that. The, the takes by the two groups are very different. The Postal Inspection Service instantly grasped the problem and I dealt with them for three months and I, I've trained some of their people and so um, we talked and I didn't publish until they, they said, okay, you know, we're, we're on this issue. It's gonna take them a long time to deal with this but they're gonna deal with it. Um, UPS, uh, mailboxes, et cetera, they've taken the attitude that, as they were quoted in Newsweek this week, we don't have a problem. We've been in this business 26 years um, and it's not an issue. Well, I would differ with them. It hasn't been an issue. It may be we want to prevent it from becoming one. And so obviously there are millions of mailbox users at risk for identity theft, surveillance of mail, unlawful interception, or interjection of dangerous substances or explosives. This is the issue. Don't tell me your Mac is no, crashing. No, 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 I get a demo program that just. Okay, <laughs> not a Mac. Okay, so keep going. All right. So obviously there's 38,000 locations, Mark mentioned, five plus million mailboxes. Um, it, it is a threat. The, the reality is the post office, along with mailbox, ma mailboxes, et cetera, and UPS are protecting your mail with $1 locks. Yeah, I mean, we, I've talked to the vendor that makes locks for both the postal service and, and mailboxes, et cetera. This is a picture of the um, mailboxes, et cetera, lock. It's a cheap lock that's made in China. It's less than a dollar. They're not going to change it, at least as of right now. And this is what they think will protect your mail. I don't think so. That's my opinion. These can be opened in seconds, as you'll see. So this was UPS mailbox, mailboxes, et cetera, response um, that they take from a security perspective, that they, they take security very seriously. 
um, and their security individuals felt that it was a real problem. However, the PR folks, um, their response was absolutely ridiculous. They said, we know our customers. Uh, both Mark and I, as part of this exercise, rented mailboxes at UPS, mailboxes, et cetera. They have no clue who I am. No, they don't want to know who he is. Um, and, and so they, they th then they said that because they lock the facilities, but they give everybody a key. And in the case where I live, it was a Schlage C keyway that you can go duplicate at the hardware store, and they never changed the lock because that would be a logistical nightmare with all their clients. So the bottom line is there is no real security. So not only could we bump the mailboxes, but we could bump open the front doors. Yeah, well, right. Go. I mean, and again, they have no plans to, to upgrade this. Um, this is currently um, UPS, mailboxes, et cetera's position. Um, this is the postal service lock. Again, not much better than UPS. Uh, it's a, a one dollar lock. Yeah, it's it, yeah, it's a couple dollar lock. It's you know, it's not a bad lock, but it's a conventional pin tumbler lock. It's a restricted keyway. But God love our government. You can go on eBay and buy the locks and the keys because they're surplused out from our military bases, and so. You know, it's a restricted keyway. Granted, it's a felony to break into a post office box, but that hasn't stopped the identity thieves. There's a huge problem with keys to collection boxes in major cities getting out. They're selling for anywhere from $50 to $6,000. And the real problem is those keys will also get you into apartment buildings because they have key keepers for the mailman to get into every building to drop the mail off. And so it's a serious, serious security problem. The Postal Service is addressing that. Um, actually with Medico, but it's all part of the same picture. Right, so, so as Mark said, you know, when we first started this exercise, um, obviously there's federal statutes for key control on these, these keys, and we're like, oh shit, how are we gonna get these locks and, and enter eBay? So yeah, no it, problem. it was pretty nice. Um, but again, every key can become a bump key. So if you create a bump key for a single post office, you have access yeah to every single mailbox. Yeah, and, that, and you go rent a box. This is the problem that I pointed out to him. You go rent a box, they give you keys. You modify it, it's a bump key. All right, so the Postal Service's response was much better than UPS mailboxes, et cetera. They were aware of the problem. They are going to upgrade the locks. They're going to ensure security. Um, it is a huge task, and it's going to be very expensive for them. Um, so before we go into legal issues, we just want to show you a quick video, if I can get this sound okay. Uh, that sounds good. We're in a uh, Midwestern UPS mailboxes, etc. store, typical location. Normal mortise cylinders on the door, no restricted keyway. Uh, everybody has a key that has to access their box on a 24 hour a day uh, uh, access. And so there's really no uh, real security to get into this facility. Uh, we're going to enter and use a standard uh, bump key that's been cut for this lock. These uh, are produced by a variety of vendors, but as you'll see, it's a uh, few seconds to open them. Um, I'm a uh, box renter at this facility, so I have a uh, key to enter. That was opened in... Uh, it's it's a $1 lock. These are uh, typical... Uh, of uh, mailbox, etc., locations throughout the United States and around the world. And they are not secure. Now, obviously, that's my opinion. <laughs> and, and as you can see, it's open. That's a, that's a USPS box lock that's used everywhere and it's open. And as you can see in one wrap, that was open. Just like that. 
This is the CBS affiliate for our state. And the reporters are open to all this. If a reporter can do it, anybody can do it. And this reporter did it in just a few seconds. Did you get it? Yeah, there you go. Wow. Yeah, wow. We, I figure if we get enough media attention, they're going to change some, some statutes to deal with this issue and the manufacturers, some of which I deal with on a regular basis, are going to pay attention. Some, the folks I deal with, they are paying attention to this. The problem is they have an embedded base of millions and millions of locks to deal with. So we'll try and get through this quickly, um, talk about current statutes, trafficking in pre-cut pre bump keys. We'll show you some sites today that are actually selling bump keys on the internet. Um, whether or not the manufacturers are liable um, for knowingly uh, producing locks that could be bumped open. And what are the insurance companies doing um, if you suffer a loss via bumping? Um, so current statutes, Mark? Yeah, there's several federal statutes, so we'll, I'll summarize these pretty quick. The mail statutes control what's mailable and non-mailable through the post office, UPS, DHL, basically anything in interstate commerce. So all these sites that are selling bypass tools, picks, whatever, the statute actually says they can't send them to anybody but s certain classes of individuals, that is locksmiths, uh, car repossessors, manufacturers. This statute was written originally about 70 years ago. It's way out of date. Um, it specifically excludes bump keys. The way I read the statute, all keys are exempted, which is a problem for you folks because there's a lot of websites now that are popping up selling pre-cut bump keys for specific keyways. And so I'm, I'm dealing with the Postal Service for them to, to look at changing these statutes to control this a little more to folks that need to have these keys. By the way, law enforcement isn't included in this, so they can't buy these either. So um, you spoke about trafficking in bump keys. Um, our position is that bump keys should be restricted. Um, everyone should not be able to buy these. They should be restricted to locksmiths, security professionals, researchers involved in identifying vulnerabilities and exposures, um, but average citizens should not have access. Yet you can go to lockpicks.com, purchase a bump hammer and bump key for the good price of $26. Or Holly Lock Supply and get Arrow, Quickset Master, National, Wiser, Westlock, Titan, Yale, a whole host of keys ready shipped to your house for $44. Yeah, and you're ready to open the locks. Um, so these are available today and they're not currently uh, covered by the statutes. Um, we think this is a significant problem. Manufacturers, so, you want to talk? No, no, go, right. go. Manufacturers liability in two minutes. I don't know that they have any, but my suggestion is, and I've recommended it to the folks I do work for, um, I think the packaging on the lower level locks ought to tell the public that there is a problem. The public needs to understand the vulnerability so they can make the assessment and the decision whether there's a security issue and they can decide to accept the risk or buy more expensive locks. If you spend the money, you can get locks that cannot be bumped open. But the, everybody ought to know about it, and that's why we're here today. Go. Um, so if you suffer a loss, um, if you must show proof of entry, um, then thefts may not be recoverable. Your insurance carrier may not uh, bind coverage for that. Yeah, this is going to change because this whole issue now is coming to the front. It has in Europe already. And, and again, in, in some cases, um, insurance clauses require forensic evidence. Um, and as we demonstrated early or, or spoke about, forensic indication for single um, instance bumping is not evident. Right. Um, so really, this is the end of our talk. If you, I don't know if we have time for questions or, or not. I think we have about 10 minutes. Um, a couple links here. We have the links to um, the bumping paper, um, along with a, a detailed write-up on the legal implications. Also, go out to tool.nl uh, for additional information um, on bumping locks. And I'll be glad to talk to anybody offline, so will Matt. Any questions? Thank you. You've given an excellent presentation, but you've done everything but tell us how bumping causes the pins to align along the shear line. Oh, it's my friend Isaac Newton from 350 years ago. 
the key actually makes contact with the base of each pin. When you strike the key, the energy is transmitted to the bottom pin. The top pin um, splits just like pool balls on a pool table. So you hit the left one, the right one moves, they split, and there's nothing to stop the plug from rotating. It's pretty simple. Next. For people who are trying to learn more about this, uh, this type of sport or hobby and security and locks in general, uh, other than websites, do you have any ideas on where people can get books and other resources? Read my learning? book. <laughs> Lock, Lock Safes and Security, the multimedia edition. Um, I actually brought some of them here. That, if you really want to know about this, that's the reference. A, com a comment and a question. And, and for my P.O. boxes, if somebody gets the wrong mail, they just stick it in the door so you don't even need a key. Sounds good. And also, yeah, it's great. And also, have you tested uh, graphite lube for difficult to bump locks? Yeah, it doesn't affect it. Really? Thank nope. you. Next. Um, what about on like car doors? Because uh, I've locked my keys in my car a whole bunch and I have to use a coat hanger. Can car door locks, not the ignition, just the door no, or the trunk locks? No, not unless they're pin tumbler. Most of them are laser track now and okay. you won't bump those. Or even the older wafer locks. Yeah. Aren't if they're wafer open. locks, you're not going to bump them open. Thank you. Next. You mentioned that these kind of locks is kind of $1 or $2. Um, right. How much would it cost to replace one uh, with something that's of adequate security per, per lock? Um, actually, you could put a wafer lock in that may present other issues, but it's not going to be bumped open from this threat. Uh, listen, for $5, $7, $8, it would be quite adequate. I represent a client in Europe that makes a slider lock. You're never going to bump that open. And they're, you know, six, seven euros. Okay, thanks. Next. When I moved into my apartment complex, they specifically made a point of saying that the keys are more secure because there is a second, uh, a second set of ridges along the, the side of the key. Right. And I was wondering if that, how that factors into this discussion. Um, it depends. Uh, it depends if it's Medico or Asa Primus. It, it is not. Uh, the, who is it? Do you know? Um, you know, I actually don't have the key with me right well, now. Well, I'd have to look at it. I, but, you know, it can make it more difficult. But if you have those that ridge pattern, then you're probably going to open it. Okay, thanks. This is an awesome. These, some of these can be open. Next. You've given some examples of strong commercial locks um, for commercial installations. But what about for consumers who are looking to uh, secure their homes? Medico and Primus. You can, buy, you can buy them. They're just expensive. They, they are expensive. I just built a house, and I chose to put Medeco M3s in all the doors. Anybody? Obviously, they're still, you know, thieves still get in through the windows, but... Right. Anybody else? No? Thanks so much. Thank you very much, everybody. It was a pleasure. Say...